Today we will talk about the first chapter of the myth of Sisyphus. I'm using Justin O'Brien's translation of the essay. Get your own copy of the book and let's analyze the text together. Right from the beginning we are told what this whole essay is about. There is but one truly serious philosophical problem and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. All the rest, whether or not the world has three dimensions, whether the mind has nine or twelve categories, comes afterwards. From the very beginning, Camus is concerned with the problem of suicide and the whole essay revolves around this problem. Why is this problem so important? Because without solving it, nothing you do could ever be worthwhile. If the absurdity of the universe entailed committing suicide, nothing else would matter. Therefore, every other question is of secondary concern. If you want to study physics and find out how many dimensions the universe has, first you'd better find out if your attempt at finding an answer to that question is meaningful in an otherwise meaningless universe. If you want to devote yourself to Kantian philosophy and talk about pure concepts of the understanding which Kant calls categories, you'd better find out if life is worth living in the first place. Otherwise, who would care if unity, plurality, possibility or necessity were Kantian categories or not? Regarding the urgency of the question, Camus writes, I have never seen anyone die for the ontological argument. Galileo, who held a scientific truth of great importance, abjured it with the greatest ease as soon as it endangered his life. Before we move on, we need to be fair at this point and think of a counter-example. It may be the case that Galileo abjured his own ideas, but we also have someone like Bruno who remained faithful to his ontological beliefs and paid for them with his life. Whose actions should we praise here? Bruno's or Galileo's? Camus thinks in a certain sense Galileo did right. Because whether the earth or the sun revolves around the other is a matter of profound indifference. As we said, for Camus, this problem is of secondary concern. Nevertheless, many people might consider Bruno's behavior profoundly admirable. So I leave it up to you to decide if it is better to be like Bruno or Galileo. Camus goes on to say, I see many people die because they judge that life is not worth living. I see others paradoxically getting killed for the ideas or illusions that give them a reason for living. How are we to reconcile these opposing attitudes towards existence? How can we make sense of them? Whose actions can be justified? We need to find an answer to the problem of the meaning of life before we can answer these questions. As we see, the first chapter poses more questions than it answers. The answers will be found in later chapters. The first chapter is meant to provoke us. It wants to convince us that the meaning of life is the most urgent of the questions. A couple of lines later, Camus writes about the methods of La Palisse and Don Quixote. To explain what he means, I'm gonna quote the German philosopher Schlotterdijk when he was asked if he was afraid of death. He answered, Yes, I am. If I didn't have any idea of death, I would probably act like the French captain La Palisse, whom Albert Camus refers to in the myth of Sisyphus. This officer was renowned for his fearlessness, his thoughtlessness in fact. The soldiers wrote a song celebrating this. A quarter of an hour before his death, he was still alive. From a philosophical perspective, this highlights an interesting position. There is life over which death does not cast a shadow. But you know what? I'm not convinced this is what Camus had in mind when he mentioned La Palisse. Because the French term la palissade refers to a sort of truism which is so tautological that verges on the comical. 
and the song Slaughter Dyke is referring to actually goes on as follows. S'il n'était pas mort, il serait encore en vie, which means if he weren't dead, he would still be alive. The line is supposed to be comical because of the tautology it expresses. Why should we believe that Camus is referring to truism by mentioning la palisse? Firstly, because of Don Quixote. If Don Quixote symbolizes being out of touch with reality, then la palisse can be viewed as the symbol of overemphasis on reality and logical truth. That's why we read, the balance between evidence and lyricism can allow us to achieve simultaneously emotion and lucidity. La Palisse and Don Quixote represent two extreme ends of the spectrum. Secondly, this chapter is titled An Absurd Reasoning, as opposed to Logical Reasoning. Towards the end of the chapter, we will see why this is important. Let's move on. In the next paragraph, we read, Suicide has never been dealt with except as a social phenomenon. This bothers Camus because if you approach the problem of suicide from a social perspective, you will never take into account the existential crisis of the single individual. For instance, Emil Durkheim's book on suicide does not offer any existential solace to its reader. The book is filled with numbers and statistics. And if a person decides to commit suicide after reading Emil Durkheim's book, he will be counted as another number in a statistician's book. However, we are concerned here at the outset with the relationship between individual thought and suicide. An act like this is prepared within the silence of the heart, as is a great work of art. Now, statistics never takes into account what goes on in an individual's heart. The next line is quite important, and it tells us how the heart is provoked. We read, Beginning to think is beginning to be undermined. Have you ever wondered why only a limited number of people have persistent suicidal thoughts? Because only a small number of people become aware of their everydayness. And the first step towards awareness is, of course, thinking. Camus relates killing oneself to the act of confession. It is confessing that life is too much for you or that you do not understand it. Why would life ever be considered too much? Why would it ever be considered not worth living? Because living, naturally, is never easy. You continue making the gestures commanded by existence for many reasons, the first of which is habit. Dying voluntarily implies that you have recognized, even instinctively, the ridiculous character of that habit, the absence of any profound reason for living, the insane character of that daily agitation and the uselessness of suffering. This refers to exactly what I said a moment ago about the relation between thinking, suicide, and everydayness. In such a situation, you will feel like a stranger and you become detached from life. You can take this as a reference to Camus' novel The Stranger, in which the protagonist goes through the same experience of detachment. This feeling of detachment is what Camus calls the feeling of absurdity. We read, This divorce between man and his life, the actor and his setting, is properly the feeling of absurdity. We are reading this essay to find out whether suicide is a solution to this feeling of absurdity which Camus describes. After all, shouldn't we be committed to what we believe? If we believe that life is meaningless and absurd, shouldn't we stick to what we believe and commit suicide? The answer itself cannot be that complicated. The explanation might be, but the answer isn't. It is a simple yes or no question. Of course, according to Camus, the answer is no, and we have to read the whole essay to become convinced of his answer. But there are thinkers who have praised suicide. Yet paradoxically, even in such cases, they act against the philosophy they are professing.
in the face of such contradictions and obscurities, must we conclude that there is no relationship between the opinion one has about life and the act one commits to live it? The simple answer is no, because we have an instinct to survive. Our biology does everything it can to stay away from death. What we need to do is to understand why those thinkers who praised suicide were wrong, because their behavior alone doesn't provide us with an answer. Camus points out one flaw in the argument of the mentioned thinkers. Many believe that refusing to grant a meaning to life necessarily leads to declaring that it is not worth living. However, in truth, there is no necessary common measure between these two judgments. Remember when we talked about truism and tautology? We see the relevance of it here. Camus writes, One kills oneself because life is not worth living. That is certainly a truth, yet an unfruitful one, because it is a truism. Now, can we push this truism? From a logical perspective, one might conclude that the absurd implies suicide. If we were purely logical entities, this simple implication would mean that the absurd dictates death. However, as Camus sees it, it is almost impossible to be logical to the bitter end. This is the irrational side of existentialism. If we want to exist and analyze our existence, we cannot approach life as a logic problem. Purely logical or mathematical reasoning does not suffice. We need an absurd reasoning. Moreover, we shouldn't approach the problem in front of us with reckless passion. Camus calls his sort of reasoning an absurd reasoning as opposed to logical reasoning. But it is still called reasoning. So we need to take our time to go through the problem and examine it without making any hasty decisions. We are also told that tenacity and acumen are required of us. For tenacity and acumen are privileged spectators of this inhuman show in which absurdity, hope, and death carry on their dialogue.